Well, if you're joining us this morning and maybe have kids or uh, you're here for the first time, I'm, I'm not uh, sure. I haven't had a chance to meet all of you, but this is what we call our family first Sunday. Uh, we purposefully do not have children's ministry uh, beyond, our, uh, beyond just our nursery this morning, and our goal in that is that you and, uh, have an opportunity to be here with your kids uh, to worship together corporately. Uh, on these Family First Sundays where we take communion together. It gives you a tremendous opportunity to uh, tell your kids, show your kids what it means for us to come together. Uh, many times in, in 1 Corinthians there, uh, uh, Paul will give the instructions, when you come together to take communion together, right? This idea is that we are doing this very purposeful. And so it gives you an opportunity for your kids to observe the importance of communion, ask what communion is all about, and you, the opportunity to share the gospel with them. Amen. Uh, glad you're here this morning. Excited to continue on in this series. Uh, in Psalm 22, if you've not made your way there, that is where we will be today. After the horrific events of Jesus' suffering on a Roman cross, he was raised in glory. All of the gospel writers uh, record elements of Jesus' post-resurrection appearances. However, unique to the, uh, to the gospel according to Luke, Luke records a pair of Jesus' discouraged disciples, you'll remember them, leaving Jerusalem after his death and burial. Can you only imagine, right, that the city is there, many of them have gathered, many of them have sang out Hosanna to the son of David only to find him dead by the end of the week and in a grave. And they're discouraged, and they are headed to a town called Emmaus when they encounter the resurrected Messiah. Not recognizing Jesus until they broke bread with him, they returned to Jerusalem in haste to tell the disciples. While these two were telling of their experiences with the glorified Messiah, Luke records this in chapter 24, the very last chapter of Luke, in verses 36 through 47. He himself, that is Jesus, stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought that they were seeing a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do you doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that is, I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they still could not believe it because of their joy and amazement, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. Now he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you. That is, before he had died and was resurrected. These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses, that's what we call the Torah, the first five books, and the prophets, and the Psalms, and here we are today in Psalm 22, must be fulfilled. Verse 46 says, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer. That was a hard thing for them to grasp, right, beloved? That the Christ would suffer. They, they're just like us. When you go to the internet, you find exactly what you're looking for, right? You never find what you're not looking for, and that's somebody telling you what you don't want to hear. But throughout the Old Testament, throughout the Torah, throughout the prophets, throughout the Psalms, there is a suffering one who was to come. And Jesus says in verse 46, thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day. And, don't miss this, verse 47, that repentance, what season you might say, Jesus is saying here, what season are you now in? With me resurrected and have suffered and died and rose again on the third day, you're in this season where repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations. But it's important for us to pause when we look at the very little material we have post-resurrection and consider the things that are going on there. And it, 
helps us to understand where we stand in light of history and in light of the historical line that, that God has built from the Torah all the way into the New Testament in the future of Revelation. Where do we stand? Where is the church at? It is in this place where forgiveness for sins, for repentance is, rep- is proclaimed to all the nations. Amen? Beloved, we started 13 weeks ago in Genesis with a promise of a child, remember, in, in uh, chapter 3, who would reverse the curse of death. Later, we learned that the child would be a king who came from the line of Judah. We observed how God preserved the promise of this king through uh, the man, Moses, whom the future king would be much like. We learned in Numbers that the king would be a God king, and in 2 Samuel that this God king would eternally sit on the Davidic throne. We are progressing, are we not? It's why we've done this series. I hope it's been a blessing to you. We're we're simply flying over these high points, pointing us towards this day when uh, we will see the Messiah born here on earth. So after six weeks in Genesis, the series that we titled Beginnings, three weeks in a series titled A Holy Nation, we are now five weeks in a series titled Where is the king. And we once again find ourselves in the book of Psalms. Last week, we scratched the surface of the most quoted prophetic messianic psalm in the New Testament, Psalm 2. We read it just this morning. We noted that it was a quartet of voices, including the voice of the nations, the voice of God the Father, the voice of God the Son, and the voice of the Holy Spirit saying to us, take refuge in the Son. This week, we will once again spend our time in a prophetic psalm. Like last week, Psalm 22, this week's psalm, has a telescoping nature, having both near and far implications. There is very little that one can find in this psalm that equates to David's life, although we might look to moments of it where Absalom and Saul or in opposition to David. There is not much really about David's life in this psalm. Practicing Jews today, you might ask this question, read this psalm during Purim, Purim, excuse me, the celebration of the time of God's deliverance through Esther. And you can see how they're trying to figure out what is this? Certainly this psalm is somebody suffering and God delivering. Even though there is not much to be said for David's life or any other Old Testament figure, the psalm we know as Christians is focused on the details of the future suffering of who we now know to be Jesus, that God King, that suffering Messiah. Last week, Psalm 2 gave us more insight into the reality that this King will rule the nations with a rod or a scepter of iron, and that the secular nations will one day rise up and attempt to dethrone this king. As we focus on the 22nd Psalm today, we'll notice a new detail about this king who was to come. This detail points to a person unknown to the pre-Messianic reader that describes one who will be abandoned by God and suffer, but later be glorified you think back, I want to always encourage you to do this. Good hermeneutics, good Bible understanding. When you're studying, you, you've got to get to the place where the reader of this psalm is reading. And then you begin to ask the question, what did the author mean for that hearer to hear? And quite honestly, if you get there right off the bat, you're, you would say, what is this about? <laughs> What is this about? If you didn't know Jesus was coming, if you didn't know that his hands and his feet would be pierced and that he would suffer and and be glorified and raised again, you would really simply look at this psalm and go, "Ah, we're not quite sure what to do with it. It is prophetic in nature. It is speaking of the one who would come. Beloved, Psalm 22 describes the Messiah as one who will go from suffering to glory from prayer. Prayer. 
to praise. And thus Jesus in Luke 24, 46 through 47, gave courage to his followers saying that the Christ would suffer. He would rise again and from the dead on the third day and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations. That's where we live. That's when we live. That's you. That's me. We turn to verses 1 through 21, we'll see three different levels of suffering coming from three sources. You're taking notes. Three levels of suffering from three sources. Suffering from God, suffering from people, and suffering from injustice or the injustice of government. Let's hop into the first set of details found in verses 1 through 5 where we'll see that Jesus' suffering came from God. His suffering came from God. The psalm starts... My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you, listen here, you might underline this because this is going to change here shortly. It says here, but you do not answer. And by night, I have no rest. I have no rest. Well, if you are at all acquainted with the New Testament, Psalm 22 opens with very familiar words, does it not, beloved? Words of deep and desperate suffering. Keep in mind that these words are inspired by God, the Holy Spirit, by King David coming through. King David, a thousand years before Jesus' appearance. A thousand years These words in Psalm 22 transport the Old Testament reader into the future and it transports us 2,000 years after the death of Christ back to Jesus. Back to Jesus. And it was at that point in history, Jesus was at the end of a a three-and-a-half-year ministry of truth backed up by miracles. In a matter of just hours, he had been through six trials and had been on the cross for approximately six hours. Matthew 27, 46 records uh, this. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani? That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So if you've done your work here and You all are very familiar with these texts, and we often read them during Easter, but if you can do your best to put yourself back before any knowledge of Jesus, and you're asking, maybe the question is you're a student of the Psalms, and you're asking this question, what is this Psalm about? (laughs) Well, Jesus makes it clear, does he not? And one of the very few sayings that he says on the cross, he quotes the Psalm, pointing that for a thousand years of wandering, what is this about? Here he is, the Son of God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He clearly identifies who this ancient psalm was pointing to. Remember with me that Jesus had proclaimed in John chapter 10, verse 30, that he and the Father were one. And in John 16, 32, Jesus said that he was not alone because his father was with him. His father was with him. Beloved, the mystery of the Trinity is both deep and wide and inextricably difficult for our minds to comprehend. But at this moment of suffering on the cross, Jesus quotes Psalm 22 and says that the father had forsaken him. His suffering is coming from the father. It is quite possible that it is at this very moment, or certainly at the events of the trials and the crucifixion as a whole, that the Father causes suffering by forsaking the Son. And why? 2 Corinthians 5.21, Paul sums it up so well in this sentence, one that you should have burned into your psyche, you should have underlined and highlighted in your Bible. Paul writes this, and and answers the question of why the Father would forsake the Son. Verse 21, He, that's the Father, made Him, that is Jesus the Son, who knew no sin to be sin, 
I just pause there for a second. <laughs> and God's holiness and his oneness and his unity as the Son and the Father and the Holy Spirit, somehow, we, 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 there, it would be impossible for me to use English words and not become a heretic. The Father abandons, he abandons the Son and the cross to make him sin. He takes the sin of the world at the time, the past time and all the times coming forward, and he places it at this moment. God is forsaking the Son, and he's placing it upon the Son. He becomes sin. Not only at that moment does he become sin, but he becomes the, the punishment, the wrath of God is poured out upon him in this horrific event. Paul says that he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God. Pause for just a second. When you think of a righteous being, if you could ever think for, of a being who is righteous, I don't think we can in our sinful states, completely holy, never struggles with a sinful thought, there is nothing in his being that is sin. There is no darkness in him at all, James would say. God's righteousness. At the moment when Christ is being forsaken, God is placing your sin, my sin, all the sin of the world on Christ at this moment. And you, you are being taken out of that sinful nature and you are being imputed, is the theological world. Christ's righteousness is imputed upon you. And now, rather than God looking down and seeing all of us wicked sinners that deserve hell and deserve punishment and deserve wrath, he looks down and he sees his own righteousness. Why have you forsaken me? So that there could be a transaction that took place, that God's wrath and punishment comes out, and it comes out upon his son, his only begotten son, and a flip-flop happens. You become the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ, and he becomes sin on your behalf. Beloved, what a truth. Jesus had never been forsaken by the Father. He had always been in his presence. I'm reminded that in Galatians that, that Paul again refers to this, sums it up and says that Christ becomes the curse on that tree for us. Christ had never been forsaken by the Father. He had always been in his presence. And in 2 Thessalonians 1.9, God says that those who are not born again from believing the gospel. I, I want to pause just for a second and, and say to you that most of you, if you've been coming here for any length of time, are going to have heard the gospel. There's not really a Sunday that we don't go over it, talk about it, imply it. But not all of you have believed it, have followed it, have as... Jesus says here that not every one of you have repented from your sin and asked forgiveness and begin to follow Christ. Maybe you could even tell me the gospel. You certainly should be able to by now. But believing, following, giving up the sin, coming after Christ, Jesus, he had never been forsaken by the Father and he is here in this moment being forsaken from his presence, Second Thessalonians 1.9 says uh, uh, that if you're not born again from believing the gospel, following the gospel, the whole book of, that sits in front of us here says that you will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord, away from the presence of the Lord. Folks, Jesus being forsaken by the Father was taken out of the oneness or the presence of the Lord, punished and took on our sin, uh, our sin upon the cross. 
Why? So that if we would genuinely turn away from our sin and put our faith in his punishment on our behalf, on the, in that transaction that I'm talking about, that we would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now pause for just a second. You cannot receive a down payment of God's Spirit in your life and continue on living the same way that you are. If you're confused about where you stand with God, if you just go on living the same way, have the same worldview that you have, whether that be liberal or, or, or conservative, and nothing changes in your life, and you have the gospel down, and you understand that Christ uh, uh, made a payment on your behalf and all these things, but if the Spirit of God is not living in you, giving you new life, a desire to turn from sin, you've deceived yourself. You're not born again. You have good knowledge. I always say this. James hits on this in his letter to the church. That the demons believe Jesus came, that he was God, that he died, that he went to the grave, that he rose again, that he distributed the Spirit on the church. The demons believe that. They know that. But they shudder because they know they will be judged. Where are you in that? A right knower? A follower? A born-again believer? Jesus being forsaken by the Father was taken in out of the presence of the Lord, punished, took on our sin upon the cross. Why? So that we would genuinely turn away from our sin, put our faith in Him and His punishment on our behalf. We would receive the Holy Spirit. That is, so that we would become that born-again person, giving us the ability to be salt and light to a decaying and dark world. Amen? Somebody's got to take Pastor Paul Grant's place and say amen louder in here. When he's gone, he's not feeling well, so I'm sure he's watching this morning. Be praying for him. We're to be salt and light in a decaying and dark world. Amen? Thank you. Paul, the Father could not be, beloved, the Father could not be in the presence of sin. So it seems that he forsakes Jesus on the cross so that Jesus could take upon himself the sins of the world. But notice here, even though Jesus was suffering, suffering by being forsaken for the first time in eternity at the hand of God, he knew of God's trustworthy character, saying this in verse 3. Through five, yet you are holy, O you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were delivered. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. Think of how Jesus is fighting back here, feeling forsaken by the most important relationship that has ever existed from all eternity. And his mind turns back to you, O oh Lord, are trustworthy. I don't get it. I feel alone. This is horrendous. But I know, God, that you are trustworthy. You're trustworthy. Beloved, when Jesus was suffering at the sovereign hand of the Father, he did not forget his Father's good nature to deliver in the midst of trials. A way of application we can learn from this praise that if we are suffering for our faith, and the Bible says that those who repent and follow Christ are truly born again and are following after them will suffer the consequences. Whether that is with your life in many countries of the world, it is still that way, or your livelihood, which I believe we'll be facing in the near future. You are going to suffer for your following of Christ. We can know that in the midst of that suffering, God can be trusted. We will not be disappointed, and in the end, we will inherit the kingdom. Amen? In the first set of details found in Psalm 22, we observe that Jesus' suffering was from God, yet God was trustworthy and worthy to be praised. The second set of details that move from suffering to glory are found in verses 6 through 11. In these verses, we'll see that Jesus' suffering not only came from God, but also came from 
from the rejection of humanity. How many of you in here have ever suffered some kind of rejection from peers, people, friends, family? Likely everyone. If you're in, if you're in school and you're, going, and you're a young one in here, you certainly are feeling the peer pressures of what's cool and what's not cool. We all suffer from being rejected by humanity. Verse 6, but I am a worm and not a man. Beloved, I really encourage you. I don't know that I could have spent enough time in this psalm in preparation for it. I, I think we get a little bit of a picture into how it felt to be on that cross for our Savior. And if you want to grow in deep understanding of what that may have been like, look to this psalm, will you? Jesus, the creator of a worm, calls himself a worm and not a man. This is how he feels. A reproach of men and despised by the people. John 1 will describe us a, a savior that comes to the world but is rejected by his own. He is despised by the people. Verse 7, all who see me sneer at me, they separate with the lip, they wag the head saying, commit yourself to the Lord, let him deliver him, let him rescue him, because he delights in him. So easy for us to forget that there's a thousand years between being written and what is happening on the cross, and we can all hear, right, intimations of those moments on the cross. Matthew 27, 39, and 43 along with Mark 15, 29, record the verbal and emotional suffering that Jesus experienced from the people, his peers, the people around him while he was on the cross. Luke also records this rejection from those passerbys, those people. Luke 23, 35 says, And the people stood by looking on, and even the rulers were sneering at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself. He saved others. Let him save himself. Eleven, even though Jesus was suffering at the hand of God and of people, he fought off that suffering and rejoiced. He moved from suffering to rejoicing, from, from prayer of need to praise. He rejoiced in God's sovereignty, giving him life and being with him even in his mother's womb. When I speak of God's sovereignty and providence, each one of us, God has a plan for in our life. And this is Jesus coming to the end of his life. I feel like we are getting a picture into the things that are going on inside of his mind and heart and soul. And maybe you have met somebody or maybe you here have been in a situation where uh, you've been close to losing your life and you'll often hear people say, my life flashed before my eyes. And it seems here that Jesus returns all the way back to the goodness of the Father. It says in verse 9, Yet you are he who brought me forth from the womb. You made me trust when upon my mother's breasts. Upon you I was cast from birth. You have been my God from my mother's womb. Be not far from me, for trouble is near. For there is none to help. There is none to help. Friends, I cannot imagine the loneliness of our Savior and what he must have experienced upon that cross. And if you are truly a Christian, you will certainly experience isolation and a sense of helplessness at some point in time, and especially as our culture radically moves away from anything that has to do with Judeo-Christian values or values purely that there is such a thing as truth. And when we feel abandoned, and we will, Notice here that this prophetic voice who is suffering from the mocking of the people turns to the truth that God was his very God, even in his mother's womb. In other words, you had a time for me to be here. You, beloved, you've got a time. Your time is now. God has got a plan for you. And even while you were in your mother's womb, God is caring for you loving you. 
Many of you know of or have experienced the suffering that miscarriages cause, but we can rejoice in that suffering knowing that God was and is that child's God, amen, even in their mother's womb. Beloved, when the world isolates us and calls us foolish for our antiquated Christian non-woke worldview, they persecute, they mock, they make fun of, even our pro-life view, just remember and take comfort that like Jesus from our mother's womb, God was our God, amen, and we are here at the exact time in history that he has planned for us. This brings us to the third and final set of details that are marked by suffering to glory, by suffering to glory and prayer to praise. In verses 12 through 21, we know we will now see that he is forsaken by the ruling class in the injustice of governmental authority. We don't have a lot of time to get into verse 12, but it is an interesting verse and uh, that many bulls have surrounded me. Bulls of Bashan. This is up north in what today would be called the Golan Heights uh, of Israel. And up in that area, and you'll see other references to this here's in, in the scripture, uh, in Jeremiah specifically, I think, it's there. But this is where they bred these wild bulls. Uh, and uh, they were uh, very much fierce, very much uh, to be only for the, uh, uh, for the elite class of people. But they are mean, amen. Have you ever been around a bull that was bred for uh, bred for rodeoing? This would be something very similar. It's an elite class of bulls. In the English, you'll find that the that this whole idea of the fierceness of these bulls is where we get our word bully. It's the history that comes in there and behind that. So I don't have time to spend much more time, but I think you get the picture. Many bulls, many bullies have surrounded me. Strong bullies of Bashan or bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They open wide their mouth at me as a ravening and a roaring lion. Now not only are these bulls to be feared, but they are like roaring lions, ravening. I'm poured out like water and all my bones are out of joints. Out of joint, my heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaves to my jaws. And you lay me in the dust of death. You might underline that. The dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. Now they're bulls and they're ravening lions and they're dogs. They have surrounded me. They are now a band of evildoers. They have encompassed me. They, these bulls of Bashan, these roaring lions, these evildoers, they pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all of my bones. They look, they stare at me, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. They gamble. A thousand years. I want you, I want you to just pause for a second so easy for us to go, yep, I've, all, I've read all that in the New Testament. A thousand years before any of this happens, it's being recorded in grave detail. Hands and feet pierced. Beloved, the Romans come up with this 650 years after the writing that there is no such thing as, as, as persecution or suffering on a cross, on a Roman cross. Crucifixion does not exist at this point in time. David being inspired by the Holy Spirit a thousand years before the event, 650 years before the Romans even come up with what crucifixion would be, is saying, you have pierced my hands and my feet. And they stare at me and they mock me. And they cast lots for my clothing. What is this psalm if you put yourself in the feet of this writer? What is going on? i got to imagine David's thinking, what is this? What is this? Beloved, these words of suffering give us an inside look at what it felt like for Jesus to be up on that cross. Verse 14, the Spirit inspired David uh, describes being poured out like water, bones disjointed, and heart like melted wax. In verse 15, he is broken like dried up pottery and so dehydrated that his tongue was stuck in his mouth. He couldn't even move it. 
This must have been what often happened and why they would come to Jesus with that, with that mixture, right? Right when he gets up on the cross to give him uh, something to drink and he denies it. His tongue is stuck in his mouth. He's completely and totally dried up, broken like dried up pottery. Verse 16, we see his hands and feet pierced in an awareness of every bone in his body. Friends, if you've ever been hurt, and you're suffering physically, what is it about that, that you can feel that joint and you can feel your heartbeat throb inside that joint or whatever it is that's hurting you? That's the pain and suffering Jesus is feeling here. I can feel every bone, and there's some pretty small ones in your body. And who were these that brought on the injustice of this suffering? They were the rulers, the ruling class the bulls of Bashan, the Romans, and the Jewish, Jewish ruling class who were supposed to be upholding the laws, but in a strike of absolute injustice, brutally beat and pierced the hands and feet of their creator. You don't have to do too much study into uh, Jewish history, even Roman law, to know that the first two trials Jesus go through are illegal trials, both by the law's sake and in Roman. They just wanted him dead. Beloved, even though Jesus was suffering at the hand of God and people and the injustice of government, he knew of God's ability to save even in dire situations. Verse 19 through 21 proclaims that although he, uh, the Messiah's body was going into the dust of death, he would be delivered from the power of the dog. Verse 19, in the context of the desperate condition of the Messiah, our Messiah, records an answered prayer, but you, O Lord... Be not far off, O you, my help, hasten to my assistance. Deliver my soul from the sword. Another reference to the government here. My only life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth and the horns of the wild oxen. Notice how he, he goes through all three of those attacking figures. You answer me. You answer me. I told you at the beginning of the sermon you should Underline, you do not answer. You do not answer. There is no answer for him. My God, why, my God, why have you forsaken me? There is no answer. He comes to the end. His hands and his feet are pierced. He feels every bone in his body. He's suffering deeply from God the Father. He's suffering deeply from people around sneering and mocking him. Even the ruling class who put him up on that cross. But now, in verse 21, you answer me. You answer me. Friends, what is that answer that God gives to the suffering king? Peter preaches to the men of Israel right after the resurrection, right after Pentecost in Acts 2.24, saying that Jesus was put to death by godless men. But here's the answer for verse 21. The answer is God raised him up again putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him, that is the Messiah, to be held in its power. Beloved, the Messiah had been forsaken by God, forsaken by humanity, forsaken by the government. However, the Messiah, as extremely difficult as his situation was, was comforted by God's trustworthy character to his forefathers, his sovereign hand and ability to give him life at the right time, and his ability to deliver him even from the dust of death. He answered him. This is where Psalm 22 takes a turn from the suffering servant to his resurrected glory. The resurrected Jesus told his Jewish apostles in Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Have you received that? And you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in Judea, that is, uh, to their Jewish brethren and to Samaria and even the uttermost parts of the earth, that is, the nations. Verses 22 through 25 proclaim that the resurrected Messiah will be glorified in Israel. Verses 26 through 29 tells us that the resurrected Messiah will be glorified and praised in the nations. And finally, in verses 30 through 31, the resurrected Messiah will be glorified and praised in future generations. First, the resurrected Messiah is glorified and praised in Israel. Let's look at it, verse 22. I will tell of your name 
to my brethren. Let me pause for just a second. I am suffering. I am going to the dust of death. You will not answer, but you have answered. Verse 1 through 21. Now I will tell of your name to my brethren. Who is that? The Jewish people, right? In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob clearly assigned that this is to Israel, right? Glorify him and stand in awe of him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, that one on the cross, right? He did not despise them. Nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him for help, he, that is the Lord, heard. Here it is. From you comes my praise in the great assembly. I shall pay my vows before those who fear him. Beloved, notice that Yahweh God heard the Messiah when he cried for help. Although completely impossible for those uh, before Jesus' resurrection to see, we can clearly look back now that Jesus heard, or God heard Jesus' cry for help. He heard and he raised him from the grave. Amen. And at this point, the resurrection and the resurrected Christ goes to Israel, to Judea and Jerusalem. It goes out, right? By and large, beloved, I I hope you're maybe catching some of Nathan's class, right? The early church is completely, 100%, all Jewish. I shouldn't say 100%. There are certainly others and proselytes in there, but you understand what I'm getting at. It goes to Israel first. Jesus says this in in Acts 1.8, right? That it's going to, to start here and it's going to move out to the nations of the world. But here we see that it goes to the nation of Israel. Friends, not only because of the suffering Messiah's resurrection will God be glorified and praised in Israel, but in verse 26 through 29 it reveals that they will be glorified and praised in the nations. The afflicted will eat and be satisfied, verse 26. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember. You might underline that as we begin to get ready to remember what the Lord has done for us today. In communion, all the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families and nations will worship before you. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth will eat and worship. All those who go down to the dust will bow before him, even he who cannot keep his soul alive. Beloved, the nations will remember the resurrected Messiah's death and resurrection as the promise for eternal life with God, and they are going to praise him. Amen? We will do that today, as I mentioned, by way of communion. Because of the resurrected suffering servant, Israel will praise God. The nations will praise God. And now verses 30 through 31, as we finish up, state that the generations will praise God. Verse 30 starts posterity, posterity. It's not a word that we use very often in today's world. It's going to get further defined here, but it is is the one word that comes down and it means very much future generations. That's what it means. So you might put it here or write it in and you're going to see it here in a minute, in a second anyway. Posterity or future generations will serve him. Not only will Israel hear of the resurrected Messiah and glorify him, not only will the nations, right, but the future generations will serve him. It will be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They will come and will declare his righteousness to a people who will be born. That is that he has performed it. What has the Father performed? He gave victory over the dust of death to his suffering servant. He delivered Jesus from the grave, placing upon all who will repent and believe in Jesus' righteousness while placing our sin upon Christ, causing him to suffer on our behalf. What will the nations, what will they celebrate? The righteousness of Christ placed on us. 
What should we be telling future generations? What should we be telling our bosses? What should we be telling our peers? What should we be telling everyone that we run into that God is providentially allowed to be in this place? You should be telling about that forgiveness of sins and repentance will allow an eternal life with God your Creator. The future generations. Jesus in his resurrected state, you'll remember as I finish here, that he would said that he would suffer, that he would rise again from the dead on the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations. Friends, if you are born again and here, you have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, you are part of the generations that have received Jesus' righteousness. And have the privilege to declare his righteousness to the people around you. Are you doing that? Are you growing in that? Your ability to understand the gospel and God's greatness, his glory, his his holiness, and and the sinfulness of man, and the need of Jesus, the God-man, to fill that gap so that you might become the righteousness of God as he became sin for you. Are you doing that? That is what... The generations will be preaching until the return of the king. Amen. Grow in your ability. Get books. Talk to to Steve and Shara who go out uh, oftentimes weekly and share the gospel with people. Get engaged in your community. Tell the generations and especially tell your children. Amen. Amen. Beloved, Psalm 22 describes the Messiah as one who went from suffering to glory and from prayer to praise. Let's pray.